Well, who's here to see illegal drugs do not exist? Yeah, and who's here to, to see uh, putting yourself back in the equation, rescuing your biochemical possibilities as a legal interface? Okay, well, it's been billed as two things. So uh, last night I mixed the two together. It's a bit like you don't know what, what takeaway to have, where to have uh, pizza or curry. So you have curry and a pizza. You're going to get both talks crammed into one. And hopefully everybody will have a transformatory experience today. This is a little bit like a workshop. If you've got uh, any real questions that are burning and you're not following what I'm saying, make yourself known. I don't mind. It's not that formal. So the idea is that we have a transformative experience and we re really understand the paradigm that is the law and language, because that is what this is about. So uh, here we go. Um, first of all, I'd like to just mention how I got into this. Um, well, it's going to make you spin listening to this, I think. Yeah. So I don't know how many people know this gentleman. Uh, I was working as a criminal lawyer and uh, in around, I think it was about 2006 or seven. I had a phone call in the middle of the night from a prisoner who used to make his own LSD. He was, a, uh, he was known as the Wizard KC, and he'd been banged up. And he found out about me because I was working as a solicitor, and I'd had some um, things quoted in various cases on drugs. And KC found out about that and decided to give me a call. And he used to call night after night talking about, about the law. And he would, he had, before I, I actually got to meet him, he'd already studied law for about two years in, in prison. And what this meant was that he had actually learnt more than any lawyer that I knew. And it was a complete reversal of sort of client-solicitor relationships that he was sort of telling me the law and I was going, right, yes. And he, he sort of took me on various courses and, and other things to try and get me up to speed. So it was a, a transformation for me uh, meeting Casey. And uh, the, the reason why I put this uh, blotter art uh, that we were having uh, signed in Basel uh, is uh, just the name Albert. There's another Albert, Albert Einstein. And Case used to talk about Albert Einstein. He always talked about uh, having to solve problems at the next level, an another level, not to look at the problem face on. And this is what he realized. For two years, he'd been fighting the law and saying, the law is wrong, the law is wrong, and the courts weren't listening. So what he realized that he had to do was he had to engage with the law and really understand it at, the, at, at, at another level. So he got in uh, writing these um, articles in about 2007 called We Have a Problem, a Paradigm Shift. And uh, shortly after that, when we were talking every night and uh, it was just driving, uh, driving us all crazy because you know, all night he was talking. And I said, no, you've, you know, we've, got to, we've got to allow this, uh, take these calls. My wife was saying, no, no you know, come back to the, the bed. And I was going, no, we've got to talk to Casey. You know, he's, he, he can make LSD without even using any precursor chemicals. He's got a, a, a cell phone. He hides up his, up his bottom. And he, he, he's, he's a great guy. So it's, he certainly taught me a lot. And uh, let's, um, the next slide um, is a little bit uh, depressing, really, I'm afraid to say. Uh, this was done by a friend. It's an artistic impression of what's going on. I don't know if you can actually read from the back. What these represent, these circles, are... are are ourselves, and we are, we're separated from the environment and from each other. And this is the terrible situation we find ourselves in. This is why I want everyone at this meeting to become a transformatory force for, for, to beat prohibition. This is what it's about. The tools that Casey sort of introduced me to and we worked together on and that I'm bringing here today, these are the tools that can dismantle prohibition. And not many people know about them because they're, they're different. The, the next level, the next level. So uh, what's happening here is, is that what law has done is that it's in, effectively separated us. And the, the, the barriers that, we, that s separate us from our environment and from each other are actually made of words. And um, we'll come back to this slide just to explain it, because I haven't actually said about um, you know, how the words uh, impact upon us. But this, sort of, this idea is, is that um, what we have with drugs is just a continuum of ourselves, if you like. It's an part of the environment, and we are permeable to that environment through so many different means. We're permeable to all these molecules that have all these incredible different effects, and yet it's censored. So always remember that it's not about controlling drugs. It's about controlling your access to consciousness and, and, and how that affects us, not only as individuals, but also as social beings. We, we, are, we are separated. So it's all in the language. 
Uh, let's try this way. Doesn't seem to be moving. That's it is now. Um, so, one of the things that Casey sent me on, and I, I'm not here so, uh, so selling other products or anybody else's product, but I found it very interesting. He sent me on a, a course called Landmark Education, which particularly looks at the power of language. And what language is actually doing is, is that we often imagine language is something that we're fitting to describe the world as, around us, and, and that uh, somehow is sort of responsive to the, uh, our environment. Whereas, in fact, what's actually happening is that we are creating our environment through language. Language is, is the cutting edge of it, which brings, it in, brings reality into being. It actually creates it. And the, this is why we have to use the right language, as particularly with this idea of legality. Because legality, this is the thing that always gets me. People want to talk about legality, and they want to do it in layman's terms, and they want to make it easy to explain, so that other people will understand, easy to understand, rather. So we play with this idea of legality, and we try to put it in layman's language. Unfortunately, this is the one thing that we must not do, and it's the thing, actually, that has, has taken over drug policy discussions because they're using the language of prohibition, perhaps unwittingly, but nevertheless, we are stuck in language that is, is, is false and gets us nowhere. And the one that, that we are going to be looking at, because I promised to do illegal drugs do not exist today, is it's not, this is not just semantics. At first, the first reaction, and if you're having a problem with this, let me know, but it's not just about semantics. It really is the bread and butter of our reality. Law is defining our social freedom. It defines who we are as people, who we are as a community. That's what law is doing. And with drugs, it's even more important because in a way, what we're defining is reality on a biochemical level which molecules that we can have synergies with, which, which molecules come through our natural permeability and affect the way that we think. And the permeability that we have has been obscured because we actually have a blanket censorship. The only things that can get through this membrane are things like nicotine and, and pharmaceuticals and alcohol gets through this membrane, but everything else is not allowed through. Now, you may think that well, I do plenty of drugs in my spare time, so it, this censorship that uh, the speaker's talking about is not actually real. So I'll come back to that in a second. But um, it is, uh, even if you manage to obtain so-called you know, controlled drugs, I don't call them illegal drugs, controlled drugs is the, is the legal term. I'll come back to that expression because it's also got problems. Um, because it's a... Um, it's, it's another, what we call a transferred epithet, and this is a short version of speaking, so that rather than saying these are drugs that w there are controls that uh, apply to us in respect of those drugs, we just call them controlled drugs, even though that sort of makes out the drugs are being controlled. Of course, you can't actually control the drugs. It's a, not only is it an oxymoron because we're completely lost control of controlled drugs, but actually... It's a linguistic impossibility, and it's a, a philosophical impossibility. You can't control drugs because drugs don't behave. You can't tax drugs because drugs don't have money to pay you. You can't legalize drugs because drugs cannot be illegal. You can't decriminalize drugs because drugs are not criminals. So why use language which is completely ineffectual? In fact, it's wrong. Now, controlled drugs is the expression. And so what we mean is not drugs which are controlled like the verb, it's actually a table of drugs of which we are controlled, verb, with respect to the noun. So in the Misuse of Drugs Act, which is the primary law that we have, it's completely misunderstood. And the Misuse of Drugs Act is an instrument of regulation. It's an instrument that regulates our activities. It does not regulate drugs. It regulates human activities. And if you care to have a look at... Uh, I've, I've, We'll quote a couple of these sections for you later, um, like section 22 and 31. They are incredible sections which can make all kinds of uh, differentiations for people. And the one thing that, uh, when I tell people that drugs are not illegal, usually the next thing they say is, ah, well, it's the use of drugs which is illegal, isn't it? Well, actually, no. There's no crime of using drugs either. Surprise, surprise. And does anybody know why no crime of using drugs? 
Well, it's the Misuse of Drugs Act. We'll come back to that. It's the Misuse of Drugs Act, not the, not the Use of Drugs Act. Okay? And so the idea of controlled drugs, what it does, it affords us some rights and agency. It's a bit like driving a car. It's not illegal, but it becomes illegal as soon as you start driving like an idiot. So uh, controlled drugs, they can be controlled, make provisions for, you can have it, do your experiments, do your private meditation, do whatever you like in private in theory. And then the misuse comes when you start like selling to children or, or streaking down the, the street and, and screaming. Then there's an antisocial element to that. And that's the sort of things that should be illegal. I'm struggling with this button. Um, hmm. Right. Yeah, so um, so uh, nowhere in the known universe do illegal drugs exist. It is completely an impossibility. So while some of the things that I'm saying today are specific to, to English law, excuse me, they're not actually um, um, universal in every regard. But one thing that is universal is this idea that there's no such thing as a controlled drug. Sorry, an illegal drug. Of course, there's such a thing as a controlled drug. Excuse me. So the problem with illegal drugs, I mean, if it's not enough for you that they don't exist, then that's, I mean, that should be enough reason not to talk about them, surely. Why talk about something that doesn't exist? But this idea is at the core of the oppression that we suffer under prohibition, because what this concept is, this dehumanizing construct that, uh, that, the, that somehow objects, they control objects and they can declare them illegal, also creates the other big problem that we know with drug policy, this idea of legal drugs. You can't have illegal drugs without legal drugs. But what do legal drugs mean? Are the, we think this is alcohol and tobacco, don't we, and things like that. Well, not exactly. What legal drugs really are, are the people who are allowed to profit out of dangerous drugs and to sell you those drugs without any kind of consequences under the Misuse of Drugs Act. Yes, there is separate legislation about how to run an off-license and all that kind of thing, but that's... Not, they're not counted as drugs because of this category error that you've got your legal, illegal drugs and you've got your legal drugs. Of course, that's just a big line right down the middle of, of people, not drugs. So remember, it's not like an apartheid between drugs. It literally is an apartheid between the people concerned with those drugs. And as soon as you, you believe in these two categories, you end up with this kind of nuance-free idea that it's either on or off. It's like a binary system. Then you have to explain what you mean. So transform and say, well, you want to legalize or decriminalize drugs. And this is what we mean. We mean this, we mean this, we mean this about every single drug. And they make a fetish about every single action with every single drug. They're avoiding the general principles. The general principle is where, where is the threshold for interference into my private life? At what point when I'm doing things, drugs or no drugs, who, it's my private life. You don't know if I'm taking drugs. But at what point do the police come knocking on the door and say, excuse me, we need to do some blood tests and check your property and destroy your life for you? Well, at what point does that reasonably happen? Well, it doesn't just happen because I've got drugs. It shouldn't just happen because I've got drugs in the drawer, but it does because they're illegal drugs. It's because they're not. But all those nuances of how to, how to treat people have been lost under this um, agency-destroying uh, uh, idea. So... The other thing is, we'll, a lot of people talk about, they'll say, let's get rid of the Misuse of Drugs Act. You know, it's an absolute uh, pig, and, you know, we don't need it. Well, yes, it is being used for some very, very bad purposes. But actually, as Casey worked out, he, he, this was his uh, speciality, is to look at how, actually, the law that we understand it is actually a mirror image of, 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 of actual law. So that the law doesn't make drugs illegal at all. It's meant to... And this is why there's no crime of use. It's meant to regulate people. So is it, if, if drugs are not illegal and using drugs is not illegal, then is it the possession or the supply of drugs that must be illegal? Well, not quite. We're still not there yet. So drugs not illegal, using drugs not illegal, and now not even the possession and supply of drugs is illegal unless you don't have authority exemption or license. And this is what Casey said, but his real crime was not to just to produce like LSD and DMT uh, and 2CB and, and all kinds of, all the main psychedelic molecules, was, not to, was that he did it without a license. Yet he got a 20 year sentence, worse than the people who made ricin with the intention of killing people. 
So the thing that is missing is this license and exemptions. And look at these sections, 22 and 31. I mean, how, how incredibly broad they are. They're, 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 they're so beautifully vague. I mean, you can make different regulations with respect to different classes of people, classes of different substances, in any way you want under Section 31. But I mean, this is without new law. This is the secondary law that I'm talking about. So my complaint is not a much, so much about the Misuse of Drugs Act, it's the administration. So we're talking public law, administrative law, about how they um, actually do their job. And they do it based upon a lot of errors in their thinking. Right. It's still pushing buttons. It's not the wrong button, uh, just... Um, Mm -hmm. Right, so these regulations that I'm describing, these, when I talked about the, this impermeable membrane around all of us, which is made of words, which is made of this idea that there are illegal drugs that cannot get into our system, it's these regulations that actually make the law constitutional. I don't know if anybody had heard about a, a case in Vancouver for safer injection facilities, an uh, organization called Insight. Now, they took their case, because the ministers refused to allow them to have safer injecting facilities. So what they did was, they took a case to, the, to their, their high courts, their Supreme Court, uh, uh, through their charter, which is a bit like our human rights uh, uh, instruments, our, which, for what they're worth, the European Convention of Human Rights Instruments. And they've got a charter of fundamental freedoms. And what the court said was, was that the minister is supposed to use two sections in their law, which are... In their law, it's sections 55 and 56. In our law, you can see it's sections 22 and 31. This is how the minister makes the law constitutional, so it's not a blunt instrument to violate people that shouldn't be caught up. So he uses this flexibility. And that's what they said. They said this, is, this is what these, these, um, these, these uh, things exist for. So uh, I'm just going to try and move it on. So, um, so the permeability, back to that slide, I mean, what's, what's making it impermeable is the misuse of words. It's the idea that these illegal drugs are impenetrable. You're illegal before you wake up in the morning. You've done nothing. There's no reference to your outcome at all. This is the problem with prohibition as it works. It's, it's entirely that they don't recognize and cannot differentiate between uses that do not cause social harms and those that do. And I'm saying that once we get rid of the fake language, the false paradigm that is, um, is a plague upon not a uh, reform movement, almost every reform um, speaker and organization talks about um, illegal drugs or illicit drugs. The same thing, this idea of um, dehumanizing us with this uh, edifice that is impenetrable. Um, see if I can get to another slide without breaking my fingers. Push it there. So, it, how, how did all this happen? I'm sorry about this uh, uh, Jacob Rees Mogg character. Um, it wasn't, you know, my, my, my word art is not very good. The big slides were done by someone else. So, what actually happened? How did we ever become so obsessed with these objects that uh, are supposedly illegal? It's, it's an analogy that I'm giving you here is, is the reflection in the mirror because we, we look in the mirror and somebody says, Is that you? Or, you know, is that you in the mirror? You think, Yes, that is me. Well, of, of course, it, it isn't you because it's just an image of you but it's also a reversed image. But we don't care. I mean, I don't remember any of these two characters in Star Trek, a sort of, um, a, 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 a sort of a play on racism in, Star, in the future. And uh, there was one of them, and he was like with, with a crowd of more normal looking human beings. And uh, he was like going crazy. And, uh, and when this other guy arrived, he really went crazy and was like, they were trying to kill each other. And nobody could understand why. Here's two of you, you're both the same, you know, in, in, in this strange world, that we, 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 you're the, the only two, and you're trying to kill each other. So, no, we're not the same. We're not the same. He is the opposite of me. He's the opposite. And for them, it was very important. And we don't actually think it's important. The same way, in language, we don't think it's important when we use these figures of speech that switch and reflect. And what's happened, the reason why I keep hammering this home with these sort of fairly crude analogies, if you like, is that what's actually happening is a mirror image of law is that they literally, literally fooled you, and they, um, they did everything backwards. Now, they say, the Home Office say, that their policy of prohibition is reflected in the terms of the Misuse of Drugs Act. 
are clearly what they're trying to say is, is that the act itself, which I keep saying is not that bad, it's okay. It's got all these regulations. It doesn't criminalize use of drugs. So, you know, it's not such a bad tool after all. But does it really um, reflect prohibition? I don't think so. It, not in that sense. But if you think about reflection in its other sense that I've been talking about, then it absolutely does. So it reflects in a completely misleading way. Does that make sense? Is it, are people following this, or is it too weird? <laughs> right, well, there you go. There's the reflection. That's what, you, that's what it is. It's literally that confusing. A reflection of reality is what you're seeing. When you think about illegal drugs, that is a complete false paradigm whereby you believe that these drugs have some kind of status. They don't. All the authorities can do is control you, and the big difference is, is that when they control you, they have to explain that you have rights and you have agency. And they need to differentiate between your actions, which control, uh, sorry, cause social harms to other people, and those actions that do not. And the reason how they get away with it is by fooling you with the, or these, these abstract uh, edifices of, of legality and illegality. Of course, the idea of legal drugs is a big problem because it excludes all those people from neutral law. The law is neutral. It's meant to be outcome-based. They're meant to be looking at outcomes and then making regulations. But instead, they're looking at things that have a status. So it's, no, that's legal and that's illegal. And the whole of the administration of the law is built on a myth. And so how do we get around this? I want you all to be like incredible uh, speakers and, and, and to take from this conference like a wave and plant seeds and refuse to stand for it because it is really offensive. The concept of drug legality is, is worse, in a way, than being called a slave because it literally steals all your agency away. Don't tolerate it. When people talk about legalizing cannabis, it sounds a nice idea if you want to make a fetish of the green in one thing rather than think about your human rights. Your human rights, what is the threshold for interference? Read any drug. It doesn't come through the lens of cannabis. It comes through the lens of human rights. So don't get sold down the river that because somebody's got a license to do something with one drug, this is the thin end of the wedge. It isn't necessarily the thin end of the wedge. It may be a way away from, from, from your freedom. If your freedom comes at the expense of a, of a prescription and a begging note for a little bit of sanitized weed in a cup, you know, that isn't really what freedom is. So... Yes, all these things are transferred epithets. Now, I'm not going to go around saying you can't ever say regulate drugs without me breathing down your back and saying, oh, God, what have you just said? You know, how can you regulate drugs? You mean regulate people. Well, the one at the top, we have to stop because the illegal legal drugs binary is the thing that we must destroy. Drug decriminalization, well, you see, I'm going all the way with this now just to stop to stop you, to pull you back, and get you into the human-centered paradigm. So you realize it's your consciousness that's being controlled. It's your possibility of being. It's all those keys that are out there in the environment that give you more access and, and more social relations instead of us all being atomized and all policing each other and all, and all, all, all broken forces, is that just to, to get out of the drug legality paradigm, drop all of these transferred epithets. So I don't even, you know, although I don't, it's not very nice to, to jump on someone for saying drug regulation, so we can't really regulate drugs. It does look like I'm now being a bit pedantic. But the reason I, I do that is because at the core of it, the le legal and illegal thing, those are the things that we really need to beat. Now, European Convention of Human Rights, yeah, people get very excited about it and they think these are wonderful things and, we, you know, we mustn't leave Europe, we mustn't lose these rights. <sighs> We've never done a thing for any drug user. And, uh, you know, somebody took uh, a case of Rastafarian, tried to get cognitive kind of religious freedom to use cannabis, and knock them back. And the reason why we get knocked back, the reason why you have no human rights is that you don't exist. Literally, in their eyes, we don't exist. If you believe that drugs have legal status, that means you don't. It's a, it, we're blind to human rights. So that even Article 9, which has this, it, um, interesting idea of freedom of thought, which is an indivisible concept, which is exactly what I'm trying to, to get. Um, it's still based upon this idea that drugs are illegal and there's all these caveats. So I wouldn't put too much hope. We need to fight politically and through revolution for a right to cognitive liberty. And cognitive liberty is the new thing that we definitely need 
and it has two main limbs to it. I want everybody to become a, 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 you know, a spokesperson for cognitive liberty. And there's two things about it. The first one is, is that you have a private life to put inside your body any mind-altering uh, altering drug on the proviso that you don't cause harm to other people. That sort of John Stuart Mill principle of harm to others. So we're not going to, um, to beg for this. You know, that is a basic. And the other aspect of cognitive liberty, when we're moving into technology and covert use of drugs and all these things that have happened in the past with you know, people have been experimented on with LSD and other mind-altering drugs, is that co cognitive liberty means that you also have a right not to be forced to take drugs or to have them given to you or, um, without your consent or even other kinds of mind-altering technology. You know, you don't have a right to be strapped into the Lucia number, so a right not to be strapped into the Lucia number three overnight uh, to somebody who thinks it might improve your way of thinking. So, um, you know, cognitive liberty, and the only way we're going to get to cognitive liberty is through the paradigm that I've been talking about. And, of course, a lot of people are very, very tempted uh, to go down the medical route. And I have to say, politically, psychiatry has never really been... Uh, the, um, you know, the buddy and the comrade and the, and the ally of the working man. Um, you know, the idea that um, we're now redefining ourselves so much as victims and as sick and, and damaged people. Uh, I'm not saying there's not a role for this. I'm not saying that people, you know, don't have trauma. But I'm saying that this has to be put in context. It has to be. It can't be the vanguard of progress. It can be a part of it. But we must always understand that what people are trying to get licenses for is based upon an administrative law that is not suiting us at the moment. So it's not just that they need this little favor that they can control, doctors can control our, our, our keys to the citadel, as it were. We, we, we need to have a general population movement as well. So I'm not, last time I said this, people thought I was, I was getting very anti-science and, and anti-doctor. I'm not. What I'm saying is, is that politically, they need to be set into a context. And the at-risk society, is something which has really uh, taken root since the destruction of the uh, collectives at the end of the Cold War. So all of those trade union movements that used to give us solidarity, uh, they've been uh, broken. And now we're into the stranger danger and fear. And this, the beast is, you know, the, the point of this, we need to, to slay the beast. Um, I think we're going to run out of time. Um, I don't like these making dangerous, safer kind of nihilistic campaigns, you know, a balsa wood chainsaw, you know, I'm not sure what that's about. You know, drugs should not be seen in such a negative way. Yes, there's a lot of drug abuse problems caused by prohibition mainly and social, social malaise, but, you know, we don't need to betray them in such a nihilistic way. So um, I'm going to leave it there if there's any questions. I've got a couple of minutes and just on the, on the acknowledgements for the people that have helped. And thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you.